So as it relates to this menstrual cycle, yeah. 28 days, I'm going to put it on the screen for anyone that doesn't understand it um, or doesn't know what I'm referencing right now. Mm -hmm. But I'll also link it below in the comments, in the description, sorry. Um, 28 days long, there's the early follicular stage, the late follicular stage, the mid lutulu. Luteal. That's exactly what I said. Yep. <laughs> and the late luteal phase. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> As it relates to nutrition and exercise, yeah. how do I need to adapt across these 28 days? And why do I need to adapt? So again, it comes down to the ovulation, right? So if we're looking at the low hormone phase, so that's your follicular so phase. day one to six, roughly. Yep. And even up to ovulation. Which is where? So around day 12 or 13 on a 28-day cycle. So right at that peak. 12 to 13. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. there. So this is where um, the immune system is really r robust and we're really resilient to stress. And we can have a lot of carbohydrate and protein intake and we're not going to be that affected. We're more sens sensitive to glucose. It's going to be pulled into places it needs to be. If we ovulate, after ovulation, like I said, progesterone comes up. It's only produced if we ovulate because progesterone is produced from the breakdown of the housing of the egg. Progesterone, like I said earlier, will hold everything in the blood. It will it will tell the body we need more blood glucose and we need that glucose to come to the endometrial lining. We also need more amino acids. So we're going to break down lean mass or I'm going to make this person crave more protein-oriented foods so that I can have amino acids to come in. So if we're looking at adapting, right, the only real thing that we need to be aware of is after ovulation, if we're going to do a high-intensity workout, we need to make sure that we have some more carbohydrate. So we're actually eating before and after having some good carbohydrate that comes in. Which is from day... 14 onwards? Yep. So from day 14 onwards, if we are going to do a lot of uh, high intensity workout or high, um, a big workout, yep. then we need to just make sure we're having more carbs. Yep. And then we have around a 12% increase in our protein needs because we have a higher amount of amino acids that are needed. One, because we're developing tissue, but two, we also have skeletal muscle turnover that we need to keep up with. Interesting. So is there any day in the cycle where we shouldn't be working out hard? That's individual. So it used to be early days when menstrual cycle research was coming out. We saw on a molecular level that the low hormone phase was where we could really push it and we could really get really good adaptations because our body was really responsive to stress. Then after ovulation, we see a fuel shift. Like I said, progesterone is, is really conserving or pulling glucose away. Estrogen's also sparing it and saying, you know, you need to go to the uterine lining. So with the change in hormones, we have a change in our fueling system. We also have a change in our core temperature where it goes up by about 0.5 or 0.5 degrees Celsius or around one degrees Fahrenheit. So our heat tolerance isn't as great. But because we're seeing more and more anovulatory cycles, we have to rely on the woman to track her own cycle. Which is hard. Well, it doesn't have to be as hard as what people think. Okay. It's the nuance of how do I feel today? So I tell women, instead of really dialing it in and saying, oh, well, I think I ovulated today, so that means I should back it down. When you go to the gym, use what we call sessional rating of perceived exertion. So I tell people, most of the time you're going to go in, you're going to have a physical and a mental, right? Physical, how are you on a 1 to 10? Mental, how are you on a 1 to 10? If physically you're an 8 and mentally you're a 2, warm up really well and see if that mental capacity comes back up. If not, then we're not going to push too hard. We're not going to work on technique because mentally you're just not there. Physically, maybe you are. If you go in and you're low on both of them, then it's going to be a technique and recovery day. You're not wasting time at the gym. You're going to make it work for you by really working slow under the bar, nailing technique, not getting the heart rate up so much. And as we're going through and tracking how we feel, we're going to start to see patterns across our cycle. And we can anticipate those patterns and say, okay, well, I know on day 21, I always feel flat. So I'm not going to schedule a high intensity workout that day. I'm going to sleep in, maybe do some mobility, recover, and really know that I'm not going to nail it that day. So I'm not going to go push myself because I don't want to beat myself up mentally. Because women do this. They're like, I suck. I don't know why. 
but it comes down to that physiological variability and for a woman to track her own cycle, understand her own nuances. If you're really onto it and you know when you ovulate, then you can take those molecular structures into play where you know you can hit your PR and you can really push it in the low hormone phase. After ovulation, you're going to switch it to more endurance, maybe not so high intensity, but more tempo type work. And then about the four or five days before your period starts where your immune system's more compromised, you just kind of want to dial it down and use it as deload. So we can take the strength and conditioning ideas of building up macro, micro cycles and deload across the menstrual cycle. So where in this cycle am I going to be strongest if I'm a woman? So if we're looking from a cognitive and a physicality aspect, it's right around where that estrogen starts to come up. So around day six. Day six. To about day 13. Day 13. Yeah. Okay. And where am I going to be least strong theoretically? From about day 23. Here, yeah. Yep, as those hormones start to come down. Yeah. To 28. Oh, okay. So the very end. Okay. Yeah, the very end. And the variation of those hormones coming down is what instigates a total inflammatory response. So if we're looking at inflammation, which drives the menstrual cycle to start the bleeding phase, we have a change in our immune system. Bleeding happens at 28. Around day 28. So we say bleeding is day one in a cycle is day 28. Oh, of course, yeah. Day yeah. one to day six, typically. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. What questions should I be asking about the menstrual cycle? Well, you know, the questions that are never asked is like, what is a typical menstrual cycle? Yes, we have a textbook like yeah. from one to 28. That's very, very rare. Most women have a cycle that might be 21 to 40 days. The bleed cycle is something that's never talked about. What does a bleed cycle look like? Is it really six days? No, every woman has a different one. And if you're tracking what that bleed is, maybe you have two heavy days, a light day, and another couple of days of spotting, and then a heavy day, that's your norm. When you start having changes in the norm, that's when you want to look and say, am I getting into low energy availability? Am I not recovering well enough? Or am I in my late 30s, early 40s, and I started getting into perimenopause? The bleed pattern is so important for people to understand because that's how we have a true inherent identification of stress. So we see changes in the bleed pattern as well as the length of the menstrual cycle itself when the body's not adapting to stress. And stress isn't just our daily life stress. It's exercise stress. And that disruption could also be just not having a, a bleed. Yes. Because a lot of women talk about that. They talk about having irregular periods or just the period didn't come this month. Mm -hmm. Is that often the indicator of the body being under stress? Yes. And that stress can be not just a bad emails at work, but it could be you're working out too much or something. Yeah, working out too much, not eating enough is a big one. We've done some really interesting research looking at recreational female athletes. So people who go to the gym three or four times a week, right? They're not training specifically for anything but life. Mm -hmm. And they tend to fall into some of these trendy diets like fasted training, or maybe they're eating too low carbohydrate because they're on a low carb, high fat, or high protein diet, and they're missing on the carbs. And again, that interrupts the hypothalamus. So we call it low energy availability. When someone isn't eating enough, for the hypothalamus to say, yeah, all of our systems can work and we can adapt to exercise. So we see on the upwards of 55% of recreational female athletes in a low energy state or subclinical low energy state, and it comes out as changes in the bleed cycle or a missed period. That's why I tell women, look, if you're tracking, you can do sessional RP, but really track that bleed pattern and the length of the cycle. Because if you start to see changes in the length and changes in the bleed pattern or just changes in the bleed pattern, it's an opportunity for you to take a pause. Say, what, what have I done from a training perspective or a sleep perspective or somehow increased my stress that my body's not adapting well? Because if we do that first, then we don't get into a clinical position of amenorrhea, which is no menstrual cycle and poor bone health and psychological issues and things that all come with endocrine dysfunction. 